you know, the war from Iraq to Afghanistan. And these two wars, we can say these are the two major wars in the first decade of the 21st century. And are very important because uh, um, it has uh, a great impact not only on Iraq and Afghanistan, but also on the world. Okay. And, but uh, shall we discuss uh, the first one? On your work first, but uh, here I, I I I would like to give uh, some background because uh, uh, when when I watched the first one, it really reminds me of uh, uh, Ace Village in China. Have you heard? I I I'm sure you must have heard Ace, but because it's about you know. Uh, uh, a child with uh, H HIV, and it reminds me of uh, AIDS village in China. But of course, the situation is so different. I mean, in, in China, the, the the people in some villages they are so poor they got to sell grass to increase their family income. Uh, but no nobody cares about the hygiene. That's why they are exposed to different kind of infection. But in the case of Iraq. Uh, there has been war, you know, um, and also, I mean, uh, before 2003, I mean, the Iraqi people also suffered from economic, I mean, economic sanction for a long time, okay, and then uh, we, we drove people, I saw many people to live in extreme poverty, and, uh, but you know, uh, after 2003, you know, after uh, the United States launched uh, a war on Iraq, and it makes—I mean—it makes the situation even worse. Okay, maybe here I—I—I I, I, I would like to uh, give a little bit background. I mean, after the Iraqi war in two thousand and three, um, you know, according to the figures provided by Iraqi body count. You know, the total death toll is around 1.3 million between 2003 and the first half of this year. I mean, it's really a, um, a, a, a big number, 1.3 million. And when we say child victims, uh, not only those who have lost their lives in the war, but also who have lost one or both parents. And the number of this kind of child victims can be as high as 4.5 million. And almost a million children are living on the streets, and two million being displaced, and all of them are always caught up in violence. And no need to say about the misery of child labor in Iraq. And we also should not forget the effects of depleted uranium weapons on children. And in the first Gulf War, the U.S. Um, had already used this weapon to attack Iraq, a light orange agent in Vietnam. And many Iraqi children suffer from deformities and cancers. And, and, and also, uh, when we turn to women, there are be between one to three billion um, widows in Iraq. And many struggling, are struggling as heads of the households and living in extreme poverty. And and in the first documentary, uh, Sarah's mother, and we can see how the mother struggles all by herself to take care of um, the kids, in particular the uh, sick child, Sari. And of course, her situation is so heartbreaking. And but also, I mean, uh, uh, we should be also outrageous to see, you know, everything is broken down in. The post-war, I mean, in post-war Iraq or occupied Iraq, because now the U.S. soldiers have, you know, have withdrawn. And um, okay, if we put it in a wider perspective, uh, we can see the impact of the war on Iraqi society. It is really beyond our imagination, you know, and you know. 
James, I really appreciate um, this short documentary, Sarah's and Mother, although it only lasts uh, for 22 minutes, really short. And I intend to make such a short documentary in the first place, or unfinished version as well. Uh, well, uh, this short documentary, the first documentary, uh, the first piece, uh, Sarah's Mother, uh, was one story of six stories that I filmed in Iraq. And three of, the, of those stories became a uh, feature film, uh, Iraq in Fragments, which we showed yesterday. And this story, uh, I, uh, I thought I might include it in that feature film, but we edited it and it didn't really fit as well. And this was a, 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 it would have made the film too long, and uh, so it was better as a short film by itself. But actually, I filmed a lot of things in addition to this uh, film. I was working uh, for two years mm -hmm. uh, filming, and this was one of the stories that I filmed. So, uh, in the beginning, I thought I, I might make like uh, it might be a TV series or something of uh, short, uh, like Soft. Tw twenty-one yeah. minute films, mm -hmm. something like that. Uh, but then, uh, when I came back to the United States, it was already pretty clear to me that. Uh, that I would try to make a feature film. Uh, so I made one feature and then this became a short, which is by itself. But both of those films, the, oh. the, the yeah. feature film yeah. and the short film, they were uh, well accepted and, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and successful mm -hmm. uh, by themselves. Yeah, although it's short, yet I, I can find it you know, so rich in human expression. Yeah, like um, the boy, who's 10, but not like five, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, but still, I mean, he did, uh, he, he, he didn't lose her to, uh, his dream. He, he still wanted to go to school and, you know, watching, you know, um, the other boys uh, to play, I, I forgot, the football or mm. basketball, I don't know, but he, he, he grabbed every happy moment, you know, uh, for himself. And also, you know, the false smiling face of the mother. Yeah. And I, I can see, you know, a lot going on, you know, under the surface, I mean, under the surface of um, the ordinary, I mean, uh, the Iraqi ordinary, ordinary life. Okay, and then there are many layers. So, um, I mean, from Iraq to Afghanistan, I can say you put the, uh, I mean, uh, your focus on children and in, in, in the Afghanistan one, and it's about, uh, I mean, I mean uh, the kids, you know, who struggle to get back to normal life. Yeah. Uh, well, the Afghanistan one, no, yeah. again, it's work in progress, so yeah. uh, there will be a bigger picture when it's okay, yeah. finished. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I mean, the idea uh, that I had with the feature film that I made about Iraq and uh, the short film was really to put the focus on uh, Iraqi civilians mm -hmm. uh, as much as possible and also at the same time to show what was happening to mm -hmm. the society. Uh, the feature film shows uh, kind of the, the breakup of Iraq as a country, the disintegration, the division mm -hmm. uh, of Iraq. Uh, and this film, uh, uh, Sorry's Mother, I, I personally felt quite attached to it because I thought it was the, the film that I made that ha was most successful in uh, showing really the human side of the uh, uh, as you say, the, the breakdown of Iraqi society and the... Uh, and, 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 and the bureaucratic nightmare. Also, I mean, right, yeah. made worse by the war. Yeah. Right, yeah. Uh, yeah. Before the war, um, AIDS was kind of a taboo subject mm -hmm. in Iraq and the uh, Saddam regime didn't mm -hmm. uh, really want to acknowledge it and no foreigners knew the situation uh, mm -hmm. in Iraq for that uh, disease. Mm -hmm. It was like a mystery. But do they have AIDS patients in Iraq mm -hmm. or not? Uh, officially, there were uh, about 40 actually AIDS patients in the country that people knew about, and uh, Sarni was just one of them. He was infected by a blood transfusion mm -hmm. uh, during the time of Saddam Hussein. So he had anemia, he went to the hospital. It's, it's not after the war. 
the was in, he was infected yeah. before the war. Uh, this film was made uh, like one year after the war. Mm -hmm. Uh, but the hospital that was treating these patients um, in, uh, outside of Baghdad was completely torn down after the war mm -hmm. by looters. It was taken apart brick by brick, all the light fixtures and everything was removed. Uh, so where there was a hospital before, there was just nothing but an empty field afterwards. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. So um, did you go back? I mean, after making this documentary, did you go back and any changes I mean, since you made this documentary? I mean, did you go back to Iraq after? I, I haven't uh, been back to Iran yeah. since uh, the spring of 2005. Mm -hmm. So it's been a while. This film is already uh, mm -hmm. a little bit dated. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. mm -hmm. Um, but now, I mean, it's really, unfortunately, this family, you know, they didn't have any telephone. Mm -hmm. uh, they were living in uh, a place uh, south of Baghdad, which was very, very dangerous to go to, um, uh, for, especially for me, I guess, but also for, even for the translators that I was working with, the Iraqi translators, that it was uh, dangerous even for them to go and be a stranger in that place, so it was very hard to keep in touch with the family, and unfortunately I don't know what the current situation is. Now. You said this, um, this family lived in, in the south? No, the uh, it was in, um, uh, I think it's called Mustansiriya, mm -hmm. uh, but it's an area uh, like 40 minutes driving uh, out the south of Baghdad. Okay. It's not, not South Iraq, but mm -hmm. South of Baghdad. And uh, that was an area where the US military uh, developed a very bad reputation because they you know, made a lot of, so they, they shot up apartment buildings. They, there was an incident where they, uh, they raped a 14 year old girl and set her body on fire and mm -hmm. killed her family and things like this. It made everyone very uh, upset. So. Uh, yeah, it was a dangerous place to uh, to work, um, and it was dangerous for everyone. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, and and at that time, you 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 were all by yourself. And no, I always worked with local uh, translators. So I was always with an Iraqi uh, translator. I worked. I think that they're all listed in the credits. Um, mm -hmm. And so uh, I went there. I went out to, I would travel uh, by uh, car down to this uh, small village where they had their uh, house and, uh, and film um, many, many times over a period of months, about a, a little less than one year, uh, in order to make the film. I mean, you can see the seasons are changing, yeah, yeah. Uh, so time is passing during the filming. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, at the end, um, I had to stop uh, going down to the family because they uh, we all received death threats from the local uh, uh, armed groups. But how, how did you get encountered with uh, this family? Uh, well, there was an uh, no, uh, Afghan American uh, journalist, uh, Fariba Nawa, and she was hired to write an article about. Uh, AIDS in Iraq uh, for a magazine called Pause Magazine in the United States, I think it doesn't exist now, uh, which was just about the AIDS epidemic. So uh, she was, she went there, she had gone out to the hospital or tried to find these patients and then tracked them down. And so it was really on the, bit, on the back of her research uh, that I found this family. And uh, on the last day that she was going there, to write about them for her article, um, she let me go down with her, so she introduced me to the family, yeah. and then I continued from there and decided to make a film that allowed me to film them. Okay. Yeah. yeah as we, you know, may all know that uh, children and women are the most vulnerable groups in in war, you know, during the war time, and. Um, because I, I, I was also there, you know, before and after the war, and I also visited hospital, but I, I didn't really, I mean, of course, maybe my attention uh, was uh, on those children who suffer from the radiation caused by the depleted uranium weapon. Yeah. I think it's, uh, I mean, um, I, I talked to the doctor and the doctor told me, uh, the, the impact, because uh, during 
the second Gulf War in, in 2003, the U.S. also uh, used this kind of weapon. Yeah. And the doctor told me the impact of the uh, second war, I mean, it would be felt after five years. At that time, it's, uh, it was 2003, that means 2008. So, um, I mean, so uh, there's so many you know, suffering faces, okay? But uh, you, 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 you just uh, said because uh, you met uh, Afghan American journalist and she's, he or he's, she's uh, doing her research on AIDS. Okay? But uh, did you also encounter some other children who suffer from the depression? Well, um, I, I, I know about the issue of depleted uranium yeah. weapons in, uh, in Iraq. Uh, the first time the United States used depleted uranium is just, you know, it's, uh, it's uh, uh, just this very heavy substance which they use to uh, pierce armor. So uh, they, have, they make uh, bullets with uh, depleted uranium cores that can uh, go through a uh, tank armor. Mm -hmm. And the, they're used in, um, on the heavy machine guns of like the A-10 uh, attack uh, mm -hmm. aircraft and also uh, Apache helicopters and, and such, uh, such things. And then what happens is the depleted uranium, uh, uh, because of its uh, density, it goes through the armor and the friction of passing through uh, steel armor causes it to catch on fire and it vaporizes. So then you have <clears throat> depleted uranium dust, uh, which is also very heavy and so it uh, floats near the ground and it can be blown by the wind and it can get into uh, the water. And depleted uranium emits a, a beta particle uh, radiation, which is not as dangerous as uh, alpha radiation, but it's not strong enough, for example, to penetrate your skin, but if you inhale it or if it, it gets into your body somehow uh, from water, from food, through uh, breathing it, uh, then uh, the particles can sit inside your lungs and emit um, uh, radiation which uh, can cause cell damage and cancer and other things. So it's a big problem and actually we don't know uh, what will be the result of uh, uh, the use of these weapons because there's no uh, there's no good studies, mm -hmm. uh, and it's impossible in Iraq and the current situation to conduct epidemiological studies. Yeah, I found it's not uh, adequate, no studies on the impact of this weapon, and then uh, and so many children suffer from it in Iraq. I, I don't know yeah. the situation, I mean, in Afghanistan, of course, Afghan people have been also suffering for, from war for so many years, this is from civil war to so the yeah, one it's, yeah. it's one one of the many problems. That yeah. Have. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, shall we? Okay, maybe. Shall we do, stop here and do we open, uh, open the yeah, open 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 questions about the films? Mm -hmm. Referring to the first film uh, that uh, the mother brings the child to see the doctor, mm -hmm. and then uh, the doctor treats. Uh, very good, and even talk to the uh, government official for further say, uh, help to to help the mother and help the, the child to have uh, further care. And then to go to the uh, um, the office of the government official, um, he talks good because he really. Uh, care about the child, really care about the mother. But do you think it, it's the kind of play when they know that you go to have a uh, documentary? Do uh, uh, well, I, I mean, everyone is polite, but if you notice, they're not actually helping her. Uh, so, I mean, I don't know what you mean when you say that he's talking well. Uh, uh, I mean, I suppose, but he's, he's actually he's actually not offering to give her anything. I mean, the the thing is that you know because her child was infected with a deadly disease by a government hospital, uh, she was hoping to get some kind of compensation. And actually, what she was asking for was fifteen dollars a month so that she could afford to hire a car to take her from her house to the hospital every month. 
uh, and uh, they were saying, no, we, you know, and this is the, the, the deputy minister of, uh, of health for the country. And he's talking about, well, you know, we could ask uh, Jafari. Jafari became the president of the country shortly after this. Uh, I mean, it's ridiculous that someone should have to go to this level of, uh, of bureaucracy in order to get $15 a month compensation. Um, but, you know, this is the situation. And uh, of course, uh, the fact that I'm there with the camera probably allowed her to get into his office in the first place. But you can see that. Uh, the situation in general was such that uh, the government really wasn't uh, helping the population uh, as much as they needed. And I mean, you know, that guy, I think he's a nice guy, uh, but uh, the way bureaucracy works where no one will take responsibility and they're always pushing the problem uphill to the next uh, uh, level of bureaucracy, I'm sure, um, you know, there are other people who can identify with this. Uh, Kind of system, but yeah, it's um, it's stultifying. Uh, yes. Yeah, I think it was very interesting uh, to see the mother saying that um, she doesn't know anymore who's their friend is, who their enemy is because of the war. Uh, I understand that there are a lot of confusions going on, and the government is probably not really functioning. But uh, do you think she would actually blame on the government, or do you think she would actually blame on the U.S. or the United Nations uh, for this situation that they're going through now? Because you know there was probably uh, healthcare provided previously before the war. And maybe it might have been destroyed by the war. Well, um, what she says when she's in the ministry office uh, is, um, you know, we didn't receive help before, and now I see it's no different. But basically, the people were helping, they were hoping that the situation would improve, uh, but then they discovered that it wasn't going to improve. So I think you know most people in Iraq. Uh, I mean, I was also like you. I was there before the war a couple of times, and you know. And under Saddam Hussein, most people were really not happy with the government that was living under this dictatorship, they can't talk, but at the same time there was at least uh, stability and safety and you could walk on the street at night and uh, not worry about you know, what will happen to you and you could send your children to school. So these basic things, and it's true that Iraq had uh, you know, very uh, by the standards of the region, they had you know highly trained doctors and uh, good healthcare facilities. Uh, and, but you know, also it's also the case that you know the uh, 2003 invasion is not the beginning of the story. Um, there was also the 1990-91 uh, Gulf War, and following that, these uh, 12 years of uh, draconian sanctions um, uh, enforced through the uh, United Nations by the United States and the UK uh, against Iraq and uh, those sanctions really weakened the population, weakened uh, the social um, uh, services uh, and um, you know, caused, uh, yeah, caused the population to become uh, helpless. You know, and then the invasion happened, this war, this instability, the collapse of the government, the, uh, the change of um, you know, the fragmentation of the country. And really, for a very long time, uh, Iraqi people just haven't known uh, uh, a peaceful, good situation. Your, uh, your bio says low-budget, self-financed films. I think a lot of new filmmakers hope that after they find a bit of success, they won't have to do self-financed anymore. I want to hear a little bit from you. Do you still do it that way? Are you still operating as uh, you know a very uh, mobile, independent sort of team when you're out there filming? How have you found that? As you found success doing it that way? Uh, well, I I believe that if you really want to maintain your independence and if you want to make uh, documentary films, uh, it's quite likely that you'll just always be on the edge of uh, a ruin. Uh, you know, no matter how many times you uh, get nominated for the Oscar, it's still going to be a struggle to get anything funded. You'll probably still have to uh, uh, pay for the production yourself. Uh, if you want to make 
this kind of film, where there's no script, you don't know what you're going to find. Uh, you know, before I went to Iraq, I, I asked a lot of different people uh, for support and funding different U.S. television channels, um, and usually, uh, what they said to me was. Uh, well, if you can find an American character to be the main character of your story, uh, then you know maybe maybe we'd be interested. Uh, but you know, if, I mean, because it's uh, frankly, I mean, you, news uh, and documentaries in the United States is uh, is dominated by the idea that it should be entertainment, uh, and that you're you're selling a product, and that you're part of this uh, profit-making machine, whatever corporate-owned um, entity it is, whether it's the National Geographic Channel or the you know, CNN or whatever. These are all corporations that are all trying to make money, and uh, the people who work there are the kind of people who work in those kind of places. So uh, if you really want to be uh, independent, uh, you're going to have to spend your own money, at least insofar like, to get to uh, not necessarily all the time. I mean, I don't want to make a like blanket statement like that. You, there may be people who, after a while, uh, if you're successful making films, uh, they'll trust you and they'll give you some startup funds to to make a to start a project. Uh, in the case of my Afghanistan project, I was really lucky that I had a, this enormous uh, MacArthur Foundation fellowship. Uh, which supported me for five years. So I was able to, I didn't start in Afghanistan, I started in Iran. And by the time I was kicked out of Iran in the middle of my project in 2009 because of the Green Uprising, uh, I finished all the, all the money that I had made from the Iraq uh, movie was gone. Uh, and I wasn't sure what to do. And at that moment, I received this uh, MacArthur Fellowship. So that paid for my work uh, for the next five years. So I was able to move my project to Pakistan, uh, work there for a year, get kicked out of Pakistan because of the uh, Osama bin Laden scandal and other scandals that happened, and then move my project to, to Afghanistan and work there for three and a half years. And uh, so I was able to get all the way through. I was able to fail uh, several times and get all the way through production, years of production in Afghanistan uh, using that money. And without that, I wouldn't have been able to uh, to shoot the movie, uh, so you know, going forward, uh, you know, uh, like even someone in my situation, I've been nominated now twice for the Oscar for documentaries. I'm a member of the Academy. You know, I receive some uh, uh, accolades for the films, but still, like, and it's true also for other filmmakers that I know who won the Oscar multiple times, and they're trying to make independent documentaries. They still have to struggle to just to get a few thousand dollars to uh, uh, to start something and usually they wind up spending all their own money uh, so it's just I mean this is the way it is like if you really care about something you're in a different camp than the people who work for corporations who care for nothing except their salaries yeah but do you, you know the crowdfunding is getting popular are you going to, to do your crowdfunding um, I, I, uh, I haven't really looked seriously yet at crowdfunding it might be something that I in the future, uh, I know some people are doing. Crowd it's been a, it's been there's kind of been a, a fad of crowdfunding, and I think maybe, you know, I don't know whether it will continue, whether it will become, you know, continue to be successful, or whether people will get tired of receiving uh, emails and Facebook uh, uh, sort of uh, people asking them for money. I, I don't know whether that will continue to be something that people do, or not. maybe I, it's something that I. Anyway, uh, time is running out. Two more questions. Yes. Hi, James for the first movie Cyrus Father. Did you like manage to make a twenty minutes short documentaries uh, in the beginning, or it just be, it just end because like of the death threats? And then, is it the most satisfying ending for you? Uh, well, yeah, it ends in uh, Ramadan and they're having their, uh, they're breaking their fast. Um, uh, 
I don't know. I thought it was uh, an appropriate ending. It's a short film. I wanted to make it 21 minutes exactly because that was the maximum amount of time that I could fit on a 135 millimeter reel of film, and because it was transferred to 35 millimeter. Uh, so it was just kind of a technical consideration. It, it could have been a bit longer, uh, but uh, you know, I've made short films before that were, for example, 25 minutes, and so you wind up with one reel of 35 millimeter, and then one very, very short reel of 35 millimeter, and it's always yeah, inconvenient for the projectionist. So I decided to make it exactly 21 minutes to fit on uh, to fit on film. That's the reason it's exactly that length. Uh, but uh, if I, if, of course, in general, if I had been able to, I would have tried to continue following the family uh, as long as I could, and you know, continue with the story because it was interesting to me. But because the family received death threats uh, and I received death threats because of my filming, I thought it's better that we uh, cut it short. Yeah. Hi, my name is Adrian, and I'd like to say that it's been very interesting listening to the dialogue between. James and Susanna, and I'm just very intrigued to know what, in both of you, in your opinion, is the difference between um, if there if there is any um, a documentary maker and a journalist. Um, something I mean, aside from the answer being that the documentary maker is making a documentary, but what I mean is intrinsically, is there a particular way that you're looking at a story or a of the world or something? Different perspective or different, different from yeah, what? A uh, journalist and a documentary. Oh, oh, so uh, journalism as opposed to documentary filmmaking. That's right. Yeah. Okay, so uh, you, you also consider yourself as a. Uh, well, I mean, you know, technically, sometimes I, you know, in Afghanistan, for example, I was registered as a journalist with the Department of, you know, Foreign Journalists, and uh, you know, I, I went through that route. But I'm not working for any daily news uh, outlet, or you know, I'm not working for an established media organization. Uh, I think that you know, documentary filmmakers um, occupy a, a kind of another space than traditional uh, kind of print journalism or TV news journalism. Uh, documentary filmmaking is like uh, slow journalism, if you want. You know, it's, uh, it's something that uh, if you're working for CNN or you know, BBC or something like that, uh, and you're going out and you're expected to produce a story every week, uh, you can't make films like this. Uh, it's impossible. So, uh, and these news organizations are simply not in the business of producing long form, longitudinal, you know, uh, films that are made over a year or two, uh, or in the case of my Afghanistan film, it's going to be made over many, many years. Uh, a news organization, traditional news organizations, are simply not set up to make these kind of projects. And so, uh, in order for these kind of projects to be made, you need to have people who are independent, who are working outside of the framework of uh, the sort of traditional news journalism. Uh, otherwise, you only have uh, the kind of news that you see on TV, and these kind of films will never be made. So it's you know it's a different it's a different kind of uh, approach, uh, and the result is different. Like you will get a different result from from this kind of filmmaking, which I hope is uh, more depth, um, uh, a greater, a broader sense of the subject uh, and the context of the subject, and um, being able to sort of answer the question of you know what happened then. Uh, you know, usually news journalism it, it picks up a story, you see something happened to somebody or someone did something, but then after that you may never hear of it again. Uh, so everything becomes very transient and um, uh, lacking in context, uh, lacking in detail and depth and so on. And so in order to get around that problem, it's really documentary film that can do it. Yeah. So, yes. how much time do you spend with your family there? Like how, how long do you stay here? 
Uh, well, I started filming this family uh, from Sari's mother. I started to, to film them in the uh, summer of 2003, and I continued until uh, the fall of 2004. Uh, yeah. uh, and, but it was, as I said, it was one story of six different stories that I filmed in the country. Uh, so I, w I would not film it continuously. I would film, uh, you know, I'd go there, I'd film for a day, uh, then I might come back a week later or two weeks later uh, and film again. And in the meantime, I'm filming other, other things in other parts of the country. Yeah. And how do you, how, how do you cope with like, leaving all the stories, leaving all the families you were uh, it can be it can be quite painful if you don't really have time to say goodbye. For example, if you're leaving under uh, duress. Um, I mean, in this case, uh, you know, I was almost uh, kidnapped actually while I was uh, filming this movie. Uh, these men came in a pickup truck with uh, with uh, masks and you know with bandanas wrapped around their heads and Kalashnikovs awesome. and. Uh, they were about to take me away, and uh, 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 actually, the the mother, Sarah's mother, uh, she uh, Fatima, she uh, uh, kind of saved me. She came running across the field with her daughter, saying, "He's a good man." <laughs> and, uh, uh, and they let me go because they were ashamed to uh, take me away because I was their guest uh, of that family, and so it would have been like somehow improper. Uh, but uh, so I mean I had to I had to stop filming there. I actually I actually came back after that because I was like ah it's okay uh, you know. But the, the I came back and the family had said that the, these masked men had come to the home and they they said you know we, we know this American is coming here and if he comes here again we're going to kill all of you or we'll kill him and so on. So uh, so I just uh, we got into the car and, and took off. And the only time I saw her again was at the, the hospital after that, uh, which was in a different part of the, a different, on the edge of Baghdad. So, uh, yeah, it's diff particularly difficult because, uh, you know, at that time there's really no way to stay in touch with them. They don't have communication. Now, in Afghanistan, for example, like most of the kids that I was filming in that school, well, they all have Facebook accounts, and you know we're all <laughs> Facebook friends now. So, you know, I can I can stay in touch. But that's really recent. Uh, that's something new. Uh, yes. I was wondering, is it possible to work with the like NGOs or other like collaboration, like getting like the families to. Like getting help to the families, or is it just like too many stories? Well, um, uh, yes. Yeah, sometimes there is there are ways that uh, it's possible to help the subject of the film uh, after the film is made. For example, um, uh, yeah, it's it's happened in the past. In the case of uh, the Sari's uh, mother film uh, and this family, uh, I did contact an NGO that was um, uh, they had a. They were in the business of collecting uh, used HIV medication, well, not used, but un, uh, but expired or HIV medication that was actually still good, but it was no longer uh, technically, it was no longer legal to sell it or use it in the United States. Uh, and they were distributing that to AIDS patients in places where they didn't have uh, availability of, of, uh, of drugs. So. Uh, I did contact a, an NGO like that, but they, they said they weren't able to deal with uh, the problems of Iraq and they couldn't, uh, couldn't help out. So, I mean, sometimes you, you can try, but you won't always succeed. But in, in my case, I don't really like working with NGO because they always, you know, try to interfere and try to influence, you know, uh, what, 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 what I want to see. I remember uh, when I well, and when I was in Peshawar, you know, trying to do a story on um, on the Afghan refugees, and I was traveling with MSF, you know, in the car, and um, he, he just, I mean, I many people just, you know, wanted to take me, you know, to 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 visit, you know, some people they want me, you know, to to report on. I, I don't really like working with NGO. 
Oh, they try, they try to stop me, you know, from taking pictures. Oh, you can't take pictures, you know, you are traveling with us, you know. Oh, you can't do this, you can't do Oh, you should visit this family, not that family. I don't really like. <laughs> The last one, yeah. Yes. The last one, yeah. The last one. What elements attached you uh, to choose the topic of the documentaries? Uh, uh, I'm so surprised you go to the very far away from your native country to to take a documentary. Right. Well, I'm going far away from my country because uh, I'm following the, the, the I'm following the political reality which is happening. I mean, the U.S. military is also quite far away from my country. Uh, and I mean, I'm, I'm choosing these uh, places because it's uh, relevant uh, for American foreign policy. I mean, we uh, live in a democratic system where supposedly the, the citizens have influence on the government, and so uh, you need an informed citizenry, uh, and therefore you need uh, active journalism and documentary filmmaking in order for anyone to know what's going on in order to have any informed opinion about it. Otherwise, we're just living in uh, uh, a dictatorship with the uh, name of the democracy. Uh, so, uh, I mean, that's the reason that I'm going there. I choose these countries because they're, um, they're important for Americans to understand. Otherwise, uh, I would choose something else, something easier and nicer. And, yeah, I don't know, uh, uh, but I, I just think um, the, uh, if you're a documentary filmmaker and you're able to do it, uh, there is a kind of, uh, if you see that, that these films are not being made uh, and that they should be made, then you know you have a reason to, to do it. And it's important to have a reason uh, to make a film when it's you know, going to take so long and it's risky. You need, you need um, something to motivate you. Yeah. But you're not sorry. <laughs> because but you you talk about the uh, American uh, no way, just so Okay, okay. <laughs> so, so. <laughs> <laughs> you you have a question? No? Many questions. Many questions, maybe after yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but you know my last last question to yeah, James. Do do you find more fellow Americans uh who who share your views now or uh, I mean, you, after I mean the war, the major war. Well, so, yeah. I mean, I think a lot of people shared my views before the war. Uh, you know, before the Iraq War happened, there were the biggest uh, demonstrations ever in world history against the war. Um, uh, you know, uh, sometimes journalists were, like I was on an NPR interview uh, a, a year ago, and the journalist asked the journalist said, "Well, you know." Uh, before the war, um, you know, we uh, we all supported it, and we, we had no idea about Iraq. And you know, the truth is that uh, the opposition to the Iraq War in two thousand three uh, was the biggest opposite public opposition to any uh, anything in history. Uh, so uh, I don't think I was alone in, in being skeptical of the war or wanting to go and uh, try to do something uh, to let people know more about it. It was. Um, um, you know, I think that people in the media, people in power, uh, a lot of people closed their eyes and, and let it go. Uh, and then after the war, when it became clear that the war was an utter disaster, a lot of people who had supported it in the media and in the government simply uh, kept quiet about it and you know, there was never any consequence. Um, even for those people who, who took part really in war propaganda, uh, in the public broadcasting service and, and other places in the United States and in the BBC, uh, taking part in relaying uh, these uh, lies and propaganda uh, in order to convince the public to go to war, uh, they never had to pay any uh, professional price of that afterwards. And I think that's a shame. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.